In 1966, Marshall Salins presented a thesis at the conference Man the Hunter, followed two years later by an article in French, which became the first chapter of a book in 1974 entitled The Original Affluent Society. Salins begins that paper with the following caricature of economic opinion. If economics is the dismal science, the study of hunting and gathering economies must be its most advanced branch, committed to the proposition that life was hard in the Paleolithic, a sense of impending doom leaving one to wonder not only how hunters managed to live, but whether, after all, this was living. The idea of primitive life, as nasty, brutish and short, in the words of 17th century thinker Thomas Hobbes, has never been universal, but Salin felt it required correction. The paper argued hunter-gatherers are not poor, if we understand that as a gap between wants and the ability to satisfy them. There are, the paper suggests, two ways to satisfy the gap. By producing much or desiring little. And the latter allows early societies to live in relative affluence. Having established the central thesis, the paper presents data, primarily from the inhabitants of Australia and the Kalahari, the conclusion drawn is that these peoples have no great difficulty in procuring the modest amounts of food their lifestyles require. In fact, they keep bankers' hours, notably less than modern industrial workers. The idea that hunter-gatherers spent every hour desperately seeking food, an extreme subsistence economy, is not new. And it isn't to be blamed on economists, who by and large intend their stories of the past as pedagogic tools to frame topics rather than actual descriptions of reality. The idea is, as we will see, very old, but Salin's counterpoint has been particularly influential, and while it is anthropology, not history, it employs a strategy common to both, problematization. Problematizing is where you take an element of the question which is assumed and instead make it part of the subject of the study. In this case, Salin begins with the question, were Paleolithic hunter-gatherers poor? Which assumes poverty can be measured and instead of answering it directly asks, what do we mean by poor? With this simple shift, a new answer can be given, that poverty is a social status. It has grown with civilization, at once as invidious distinction between classes and more importantly as a tributary relation. I recognise how bad the optic is of a rich academic telling people who can't afford food that poverty is in some sense made up, but this is not the section in which I'm going to talk about criticisms of the paper. I will get to those later. For now, I want to tell you about somebody saying something very similar in the 5th century AD. Just as the Leviathan view that prehistoric life was hard can be found throughout history, so can Salin's claim. For example, the 5th century Greek historian Priscus records a visit to the Hunnic ruler Attila. In the middle of the first millennium, pastoral nomadic groups moved out of the steppe belt that covers Eurasia and settled in regions with agriculture, sometimes violently often with substantial dislocation of existing populations and political units. Whether these movements were connected or simple coincidence remains a big question. Attila's Huns were one of those groups. Priscus claims during his visit he met a fellow Greek, now living among the Huns, who he refers to as Scythians, and that the fellow Greek reportedly compared the primitive way of life of the Huns with that of the settled Roman population. After war, the Scythians live in inactivity, enjoying what they have got, and not at all, or very little, harassed. The Romans, on the other hand, are in the first place very liable to perish in war. But the conditions of the subjects in time of peace is far more grievous, for the exaction of taxes is very severe, and unprincipled men inflict injuries on others, because the laws are practically not valid against all classes. It is important to understand the conversation Priscus reports probably never happened. It has all the features of a literary trope, in which the outsider, the barbarian, is used as an implicit critique of the society the writer lives in. 
an idea like this that somehow civilization makes things worse has pervaded human thought for millennia. And as Kaplan says of anthropology, scholars as diverse in their approaches to the human condition as Richard Lee, Irvin DeVore, Marshall Salins, Marvin Harris, Robin Fox and Jared Diamond all indicate that something precious was lost when we abandoned the hunting gathering way of life. Precisely the point of such a trope and why it recurs so frequently throughout human history is that it reflects on a commonly understood truth that few things are unalloyed goods and all changes bring costs as well as benefits. But obviously just because an idea is common doesn't make it true. The original affluent society is an influential paper, but is it right? I'm going to spend more time on criticism than I usually do because I think the criticism is the most interesting part of this and I will start with a criticism of myself. I'm a historian, not an anthropologist. Yes, these are both humanities and no, I have no truck with the nonsense that anthropology and archaeology are social sciences. But even closely aligned disciplines still have different perspectives. So my first criticism, though acknowledged by Salim when he writes, all the preceding discussion takes the liberty of reading modern hunters historically as an evolutionary baseline, is not usually given much weight in subsequent anthropology. The issue at stake for me is the historicization of modern hunter-gatherers. The idea that you can read from them to their Paleolithic counterparts unproblematically. I think all of us realise that people in modern industrial societies are descended from people who did not live in modern industrialised societies. Some of our ancestors lived in agricultural states, some were pastoral nomads, some lived in marginal areas in kinship groups, and yes, some were hunter-gatherers. That is obvious, but it applies just as much to hunter-gatherers. There is no reason to assume an unbroken chain back to a primordial Paleolithic population. A very interesting discussion of this idea can be found in the book The Art of Not Being Governed, a book that does have some of its own issues. That book argues that highland people in Southeast Asia are not preserving a pre-agricultural, pre-state way of life from their ancestors. They are actually the descendants of people who fled agricultural states, who actively rejected the state, like Priscus's Greek interlocutor. But my methodological concern over historicization is an outsider's perspective, and the main criticism in the field has been about data. As I mentioned, Salin's paper uses just a few studies. In the decades following its publication, Bird David says, Research projects informed by optimal foraging theory have focused mainly on hunter-gatherers' work time. They have reported that Salin's argument does not apply universally. Some peoples work on average at least six hours a day. Just to be clear, this is not some sort of fundamental critique of Salin, it's just how research works. The first person to look at a problem never has much data because no one is collecting it, and new data invariably alters the picture, in this case suggesting it is much less homogeneous. The third criticism, and I think one of the most interesting, is the question of definitions. This is what Salin plays with in the opening section of the paper when writing. By the common understanding, an affluent society is one in which all the people's material wants are easily satisfied. He goes on to define it in terms of leisure time, probably because time studies were the data available. But you could equally define it in spiritual terms and point to the affluence of monasteries or off-the-grid communities. Or you could define it by material property if you wanted to extol rather than disparage our own society. Or demographically, by health lifespan or dangers, and undoubtedly if you did that, you could get back to the same assessment as Hobbes, that the Paleolithic was nasty, brutish and short. The point is that wealth is culturally and historically constructed, and depending on how you define it, you can change which societies are rich and which are poor. Yes, personal affluence is objectively measurable within a society, but general affluence is not measurable between disparate societies, and it's both a criticism and one of the main points the paper is making that some questions don't have answers, or rather that the answer is so dependent on the question that it can effectively be anything you want it to be. This issue of definitions leads into another common criticism, which Bird David sums up as, these are our questions framed within our models, the people in question would not ask them. In this sense, the criticism is that Salin did not go far enough. 
I always think this is a weak criticism of a piece of research, or at least one that should be seriously tempered. Research is an incremental process. One person does not suddenly leap from a fallacious understanding to a definitive piece of work. Everything happens a little bit at a time and refines what came before, to, before it. It's good to acknowledge where a seminal article has been superseded or didn't go far enough, but it's really weird to describe it as flawed for not being something it could never actually have been. The point is that while Salen's problematizing of affluence is very useful, it is still reframed using a concept, working hours, which belongs to our culture and not those studied. After all, working hours and the associated leisure time only really make sense in a culture that sharply separates out jobs through a formal mechanism such as wages a monetary concept entirely lacking in most recent hunter-gatherer societies, and we suspect absent from our Paleolithic counterparts. But as I said, this is a further problematization, asking if there is some way we can talk about affluence or wealth in a way that is outside, objectively removed from cultural context, or if we can ask the question with a much stronger subjective context, asking how the society itself defines affluence. Anthropologists have tried to do both, but they look almost impossible to do in a historical context. A fourth criticism which follows this is that not all hunter-gatherers are the same, just like not all industrialised market economies are the same. Salen's rather slight data set seems to present just one type of modern hunter-gatherer, those which operate on an immediate return system. And most people seem to think, and subsequent data seems to support, that Salen's argument does indeed hold up for at least some immediate return societies, but not necessarily for all, and not for societies that do not have that type of system. Which if you are a historian brings you back to the same question. Did immediate return hunter-gatherer societies exist in the past at all? If they did, were they common? Or are they a feature of marginal, peripheral groups, a product of agricultural states and colonialism? And again, you can see we are back to the problem of historicizing anthropological data. We just don't have comparable data from pre-modern societies, and certainly not from prehistoric societies. When the paper appeared in Stone Age Economics, these weren't the main critiques. Most of the critiques were Marxist. Was Salin an ideological Marxist? Did the paper understand dialectics or the mode of production? Is it crypto-materialism? And so on. And I'm not going to cover any of that. If you want to understand Salin's paper in its historical context, then you need to understand the Marxist critique because that's central to it. But what is remarkable is how irrelevant it looks, like so much intellectual confetti 50 years later. And so, the part where I suggest a reading. Obviously, unlike other episodes, I've already done that. There are six chapters in Stone Age Economics, and I've only talked about the first one. That is the chapter that gets set for anthropology students, the one that has been most influential, the one people still talk about. And I've already tackled both the thesis and some key criticisms. But is it a useful reading for historians? After all, economic anthropology is a rather different subject, and the Paleolithic is a prehistoric period. How close are the methodological issues to those of the typical historian who normally works with complex material culture? Well, I think there is a central problem which is interesting to the historian, and it relates to that assumed historicization. How do we use modern anthropological studies of analogue populations to inform us about past events? Because that is a problem historians also have in using experimental archaeology or psychological studies or results from microeconomic studies, in the conventional historical dichotomy between primary and secondary sources, between evidence and literature, these things occupy an intermediate space. They are not quite actual historical data, but they are not just analysis either. And I think Salent's paper is a great place from which to begin a discussion of that problem, which is ultimately what a reading for students and a good research article should be. 